Samuel Beckett, born in Dublin in 1906, he died in Paris in 1989. The Samuel Beckett Conference of the Samuel Beckett Society happened in Buenos Aires in October 2022. Hi. Professor Daniela Caselli presented the article from the only poet, the Railway Street Academy, Sex Work and Beckett's Early Poetry. Professor Ulrika Mood presented the article, Beckett's Obscene Butter Poetry. Professor Nadia Luar presented the article, Beckett's Spectral Poetics. They are here to talk with us. Good night. It's a pleasure to have you here. Well, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Daniela, por favor. Yeah, lovely to be here. Um, um, yeah, I'm Daniela Caselli. I teach uh, modern literature and critical theory at the University of Manchester. And I've worked quite a lot about Beckett, on Beckett. And um, this work that we're going to discuss today is part of a short book that is coming out later this year for the Elements in Beckett Studies series um, for Cambridge University Press, which is called insufferable Samuel Beckett gender and sexuality so this is what I'm going to you know partially discuss today thank you for having me thank you very much uh, Nadia please good morning good afternoon everybody I don't know the time frame for everyone and thank you Alfonso for having me here it's uh, I'm really delighted to do that so my name is Nadia Loir I'm a professor in French and Francophone studies and also women's and gender studies at the University of Wisconsin in uh, Oshkosh and uh, I have been working on uh, Beckett's uh, bilingualism and practices of self-translation for a long time. And I, I will go back to this uh, familiar theme today uh, through the lens of Rancière. Uh, and I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Thank you very much. Ulrika, please. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm Ulrika Maud. Uh, I work at the University of Bristol, where I'm Professor of Modern Literature uh, and where I direct a research centre for Health, Humanities and Science. Uh, like Daniela, I've written quite a lot on Beckett and the talk I'll be, or the, the subject of my talk today will be Beckett's Obscene Body of Poetry and it the, the work forms part of a book on Samuel Beckett and Metz. Thank you very much. So you can begin talking a little of uh, this uh, first collection of poems of Beckett you work at, uh, the context uh, and uh, the first one is 1935. Could you speak a little of this context, please? Thank you very much. Um, so yes, Beckett's first collection of poetry was written in 1935, as you say, uh, and it's called Echoes, Bones and Other Precipitates. And this collection of poetry consists of 13 poems, which I think was intentional. It's an echo to uh, Joyce's work, one of Joyce's collections of poetry. And these poems for the collection were written between 1931 and 1935. They were occasional poems, uh, and they were written during a period in which Beckett also wrote his first novel, Dream of Fair to Win Middling Women, which was completed in 1932, but it wasn't published until posthumously. And he also, in this period, wrote the collection of short stories, More Pricks Than Kicks, which appeared in 1934. Uh, the title of Beckett's poetry volume, Echoes Bones, points to a key concern, I think, in the collection, in that um, uh, the title echoes a moment from Ovid's uh, Metamorphosis, book three, uh, and especially, well, in particular, the story of Echo and Narcissus. Having fallen desperately in love with Narcissus and having been rejected and disdained by him, Echo, and I quote from Ovid here, just to give you an example, frets and pines, becomes all gaunt and haggard, her body dries and shrivels till voice only and bones remain and then is voice only, for the bones are turned to stone. Uh, 
So Beckett's apparently obscure, but in fact rather revealing title, points to the collection's charting of the metamorphoses of decline and decay in a tone that in a tone and through imagery that's kind of marked, markedly more graphic than Ovid's, which in itself is quite graphic already. The poems in Beckett's collection emphasize illness, aging, and decomposition. Now, these poems were written during an exceptionally difficult period of Beckett's life. Beckett had first of all reluctantly returned from Paris, where he'd been uh, uh, on an exchange at the École Normale Supérieure. Uh, he'd returned to Dublin and was appointed to, where he was appointed to a two year post as lecturer in French at Trinity College Dublin, his uh, alma mater, as it were, his former university. Uh, and, um, and, you know, he was unhappy in this post. This didn't suit him. Teaching did not suit Beckett. In May 1933, he lost his cousin, Peggy Sinclair, to tuberculosis. And just over a month later, on the 26th of June 1933, his father died quite suddenly of a heart attack. Now, Beckett was profoundly shocked and bereaved, and he suffered a deep psychological crisis that manifested itself in various uh, psychosomatic symptoms, including bouts of pleurisy, a racing heart, or what we might now today call panic attacks. He suffered from cysts, and even a kind of incident of hysterical paralysis where he felt he couldn't go on. And he says, I, I found out, he says to James Nelson, I found I couldn't go on moving. So he took advice from his uh, friend, Jeffrey Thompson, whom he'd known since his school days. Uh, Thompson had, was specializing in, in, in psychiatry and recommended to Beckett that he should commence psychotherapy in order to address all these symptoms he had and all these difficulties he had. And indeed, Beckett had to relocate to London because there was no psychotherapy in Ireland at the time. It was in fact illegal. Uh, and he had thrice weekly psychotherapy sessions at the Tavistock Clinic with Wilfred Bion. Uh, so the background to Beckett's composition of the poems in Echo's Bones sort of helps to explain why critics have described the collection as amongst the most difficult of Beckett's works, while by the same token being the most intimate and personal, reflecting in its formal qualities the poem's fraught origins and subject matter. And I'll just say a few more words about this and before I pass on to uh, Daniela, but Beckett's first collection was is characterised by an by an insistence of bodily forms of abjection on imagery that we seldom associate with poetry. Figures such as red sputum, a clot of anger, sweating, perspiring, and phrases such as breaking without fear or favor wind permeate this collection, while in a poem called Enueg II, for instance, tulips seem to shine like an anthrax. That's a quotation, like an anthrax. In Sainis I, the title itself signifies the discharge of blood and pus from a wound. And the poem speaker refers, refers to hair ebbing, gums ebbing. While in Sainis II, a shiver convulses someone called Madame de la Motte. In Malacoda, which was written in a, as a direct response to the death of Beckett's father, the undertaker felts the perineum of the corpse and mutes his signal uh, in a reference to the way in which wind escapes from a dead body. So it's very graphic. The poetry, while having its antecedents in writers ranging from Ovid, as I mentioned, all the way to Joyce, Dante there in between and others, is obscene in the sense of being offensive to the senses or to taste or refinement, uh, which is the etymology or the origin of the word obscene. And this renders it a type of anti-poetry that resists traditional conceptions of the aesthetic as beautiful, as conceptual, 
as combining the sensory with the spiritual. The language and imagery of Beckett's first collection of poems with its refusal of metaphor and its lexical and syntactical resistances to interpretation and, you know, words like scutel, malebranca, phrases like mutes his signal, undulata, targe, divine dog day glass, stay scarmillion, stay, all these are in Malacoda, also resists the metaphysical consolations of poetry through a kind of emphasis on metonymy and semantic opacity and by insistently drawing attention to what is offensive to the senses and to sense, to sense making itself. So I'll pass over to Daniela now. Thank you very much. I have a question. Uh, do you think okay. this mixture of images, of obscene images, how you say, uh, it's, it's a kind of a Joycean influence that's a, a kind of different of the a posterior Beckett with a kind of work on synthesis. Do you think this, this influence is stronger here? There's a lot of Joycean influence here, definitely. Um, and as we know, you know, Joyce writes about the body very very profoundly and and had already published his work Ulysses but he had also published collections of poetry and Beckett is clearly uh, alluding to Joyce in all kinds of ways including in the number of poems in this collection because it in this collection because it 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 tallies with Joyce's collection called Poems Penny Each P O M E S no, not poems, but poems, P-O-M-E-S, poems, uh, penny each. And Beckett even referred in his correspondence uh, to, to his own poetry as poems or a poem, a poem, poem he sent to, to Thomas McGreevy. To introduce myself, uh, did I do that already? Yes, I did, I think. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I will just present... Uh, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a background uh, very briefly and um, go to what is interesting to me uh, and what I'm working on uh, at the moment. So, as I said earlier, I've been working on the question of uh, bilingualism and Beckett's practices of self-translation for a long time. And I looked at the ways Beckett had explored original modalities of expression, whether it is in other languages, other genres, other media, and how he has used these new modalities to forego not only his cultural inheritance, that is a, as it has been said many times, but more importantly to me is how he has used these new modalities to evade habits of mind and senses. And this is the notion of habit and habituation that haunts an individual or the artist that is of particular interest to me. And the idea of spectral poetics, of course, comes into play then. The haunting presence that occupies one, or the artist in this case, that occupies his every move, his every thought, his every gesture and perception and that prevents or stifles uh, any uh, impulse towards uh, original creation. So that's what I'm interested in, the various strategies that Beckett, as a bilingual and transmedial artist, has tried to find to unlearn habitual modes of perception and how his work, in some ways, in many ways, in fact, offer a radical reconsideration of sensory experiences. And we can think, of course, of the obvious avant-garde and uh, experimental theater, but it is also found in the coming and going between languages and genres and media, because it prevents any kind of habituation in one particular form of expression, and it also prevents any kind of anchoring and what I gather under the umbrella of habituation. And uh, so I link, uh, I relay this uh, aesthetic project of unlearning to a specific aesthetic or what I use with, uh, what I um, 
call with Jacques Rancière uh, an aesthetic regime. Uh, that is a system of presentation or representation that is associated to a specific regime of emotion, to preconceived notions, basically how one should feel in such a situation. And I, I believe uh, that uh, in a way, Beckett's whole literary enterprise compels a retraining of the senses by retriggering, by triggering, sorry, uh, new perceptual approaches. So his readers and his spectators have to unlearn habitual modes of reading or of seeing. And in some case, this unlearning can be very violent because it is imposed on them by the way they are affected by Beckett's work whether it is at the theater or when they are reading a text. Uh, and I, I, I think it's because they, they do not have the tools and they cannot translate these experiences with their habitual modes of perception and understanding. So here again, we can think of not eye and breath, but uh, it is an aesthetics in general that troubles the relation between art and reality. And as a result, the way we usually experience art from the point of view of the artist and from the point of view of the perceiver of his work is troubled. So to, to, to use uh, the, 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 the term trouble in, in, a, in this case, a Butlerian sense, which relates to maybe what you're going to talk about, uh, Daniela, in, uh, in terms of queerness and departing from the norms. Uh, this is what I see as this project of unlearning and this exploration of habituation of perception. Uh, in the past, I have used uh, the operational concept of figure, uh, think figure of speech, to describe a departure from the norm. And uh, it could very well be summed up like that. Uh, the aesthetic of Beckett would be a departure from the very notion of norm and normative uh, behavior, writing. I, I have a question. Of course, of course. Uh, for example, do you think this uh, has some relation with the fascist, fascism, or uh, this unique point of view that was around, that came from the 19th century, of course, this, this unique uh, global vision about uh, sex and women and everything. Uh, you, you have a quotation, I, I think it's a Beckett's quotation, education and habit, habit stimulated desire, the desire to see reality correspond to concepts. I think it's, it's a fragment from, from Beckett, you know? Uh, of course, uh, I mean, there has been a very important works on uh, the political element in Beckett, but there is definitely, uh, and I've done some work on that as well, a politics involved in the forms, uh, the literary forms that uh, he has been uh, experimenting with. So there is definitely this uh, political impulse, which I do not see in terms of traditional political action uh, as uh, historicist uh, interpretations see politics. I see politics in the way you reorient and re you, you, you just introduce a re a re regimentation, uh, if I may, coined the, the word, a re-regimentation of how we can understand and translate reality. And in that sense, it's very political because it involves how the police has to experience a new sensorium, if you will. So uh, definitely political uh, dimension to, to this departure from the norm. And by definition, departure from the norm is always seditious, so politically uh, politically motivated. Um, 
So, yeah, so basically this is what I've been working on and uh, I've been really interested in exploring this idea from various angles. And at the moment, I am very much involved with my friend Jacques Rancière. <laughs> and uh, it has been extremely useful for me to have the tools to be able to elucidate uh, all these intricacies. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Uh, Daniela, well, you work with uh, Nancy Kerner, uh, when Beckett was a young professor, professor of language. And, <laughs> <That's right>. uh, <laughs> and uh, you will work with colonialism, sex work, and bourgeois culture. Let me uh, show the presentation. Please. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, it's very interesting to hear again what, um, uh, you know, uh, versions of what uh, Nadia and, and Ulrika are, um, are interested in, because um, there is a very strong connection. On the one hand, I want to kind of pick up on what Ulrika was saying about the intense fascination and interest with bodily functions, but also how to repurpose bodily functions. And on the other hand, what Nadia was just saying there about unlearning, okay? So uh, in, in that paper, uh, which has a bit of a kind of joke for a title, uh, the Railway Street Academy, I want to look at an early moment where there is a very strong uh, attachment to uh, Joyce, definitely, but also what used to work in Joyce and especially in Ulysses and especially in the night town section of Ulysses or the Circe section of Ulysses stops working. And from the only poet is a, a, a poem that uh, Beckett had uh, offered to Nancy Cunard for a volume uh, that she uh, published for uh, Henry Crowder. And the Railway Street Academy is, as I said, a little bit of a joke because it's an expression that Beckett uses. This is Nancy Cunard and Henry Crowder working at the Hours Press, the press, the literary press that uh, Cunard had established in 1928. Uh, very short-lived, only five years, but very prolific. And uh, and if you go to the next slide, I can show you Daniela, the... Daniela, could you... Uh, Explain who was Nancy, please. Yes, of course, of course. So Nancy Cunard, very interesting modernist figure, uh, radical in her politics, a committed communist, uh, and uh, also at the center of quite a lot of high society gossip because she was the heiress of the Cunard empire. Um, so she was ex she was extremely and I'm sorry I was I thought I had got rid of that uh, she was extremely wealthy and she was eventually disinherited and also she was at the center of a lot of gossip because of her fluid sexuality and because she was in a relationship with Henry Crowder who was a jazz singer originally from Georgia. So uh, she led a very unconventional life. She uh, had a lot of capital that she invested in supporting artists, in setting up an apologetically uh, literary press. And in, you know, Be the young Beckett is one of the artists that she supported, for instance, by giving his poem Horoscope a prize. Uh, the, just a year, just a few months before uh, the volume for Henry Crowder. Uh, so that's the Henry music. It's a beautiful volume. It's a folio. And is um, you can see that Henry's uh, silhouette is there in the front. And you have, um, it's a, you know, perhaps you can see it's just about, you have the two very thin arms, barely visible around his shoulders. And you can tell that those are Cunard's own arms, not just because of her signature thinness, but also because she was very fond of bangles and ivory bangles. She had a whole uh, you know, collection of them, something that we might actually think slightly on the primitivist side now, but she was using that at the time as part of her um, interest uh, which was not an Orientalist interest in questions of uh, 
race equality and justice, um, but was a political, a committed um, interest. So um, Beckett is one of the uh, authors that offers a poem for this collection. And um, yeah, we can we can have a look at the poem very quickly, just uh, just to show you what um, what it is. It has a very in the next slide. You probably have the poem there, Junior. Yeah. So you can see that the full title. I'm not I'm not saying that out loud, but you know it's, it's meant to be quite shocking. Um, it's obviously also offensive, but there is this kind of dialogue between the only poet that often has been identified as Dante and this dazzling sex worker uh, identified as Rahab. So a biblical character that was responsible for letting the Israelites into Jericho and was transformed by Dante in Paradiso 10 into this dazzling, wonderful presence uh, able to um, live with the, you know, with the, with the souls that have been saved. So there is a kind of interesting moment in this poet, and you know, I don't want to kind of discuss it in, in too great detail, but there's a very interesting moment in, in you know, this poem for me, Beckett dismisses it as a kind of early tomfoolery. So, you know, little more than a joke, but it's something very interesting in which Beatrice, so obviously the quintessential muse of not just Dante, but the Western canon, is juxtaposed to Rahab, the sex worker that has been, in a way, sort of transformed into this dazzling white character in, uh, in Dante. And instead of being opposed to one another, the poem kind of brings them together and also kind of jokes around, if you like, the kind of, for instance, um, you know, almost like phallic prowess of um, of uh, these, you know, dripping shaft that happens, uh, you know, that is mentioned in that last uh, last part of the poem. So what's happening here is that that kind of opposition that you find in Dream of Her to Middle Women, you know, again, we're talking about months difference here, uh, and uh, between Beatrice, yeah, and the brothel, as Dream puts it. So the idea of the idealized woman on the one hand and the debased sex worker in another fails to work as an opposition in this poem. So even if, you know, it's been dismissed as a joke, even if instead was actually put into music by Henry Crowder, and if you follow that link, you can actually hear uh, a recording of it sung by Alan Harris. We don't have the original recorder recording. So despite this, you know, opposition that you have circulating at those, at the, you know, at that point in time, that, you know, that kind of almost like stereotypical, you know, idea of either the idealized woman or the debased woman seems to collapse here. And so the, the kind of more general point that perhaps goes back also to your question about politics is that that kind of crystalline purity that um, it, I think you can, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail to um, all the other slides, um, Junior, it's, it's, it's fine. You can, you can stop the presentation now. But in, in um, the, the general point here is that if there is that kind of idea of crystalline white purity that circulates among a lot of modernists at this point in time, especially T. Hume, especially Ezra Pound, there is something in this, a poem that was offered, you know, to Nancy Cunard uh, for a book dedicated to Henry Crowder that is beginning to undo the kind of uh, that opposition. Okay, so there is something there that uh, that sort of brings together, if you like, Beatrice and Rahab, and kind of makes them stay sort of, you know, almost collapsing to each other. There's more to say, <laughs> but thank you very much. It is incredible. I love it. And uh, bringing the queer theory to this, this in feminism to this discussion is amazing. Congratulations, uh, Ulrika. Uh, why you choose these poems so obscene <laughs> with this infernal <laughs> echo? <laughs> Could you tell us?
you are mute. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean obscene, thank you. Obscene in the sense that they are offensive to the senses and and also to to sense making because they're quite opaque. They're difficult to understand. And you know, figures like exio in a spasm or red sputum or clot of anger or stillborn night, filthy green, stump caught horribly like a claw, verminous hens and mushy toadstool oozing pestilence doomed yellow spew of the sewer uh the banner of meat bleeding um they prominently reference the senses you know vision touch hearing and smell in a way that's surely intended to evoke and to forcefully also satirize uh the aesthetic uh recalling the words origin in the greek oistikos which means of or relating to sense perception the references, you know, can't be considered beautiful. Instead, they can they can be seen as sort of actively working against notions of the aesthetic, functioning as an offence on beauty, obscene in their an aesthetic sense. And something similar can be said, for instance, for the poem Enueg Two, where tulips, as I mentioned already, shine like an anthrax. Uh, and where figures uh, figures such as sweating like a Judas and perspiring prof profusely, in fact, challenge the very possibility of the aesthetic, insisting, as uh, John Pilling has pointed out, upon the ugliness of it all rather than the beauty of it all. And then furthermore, you know, Beckett chooses the medieval genre, for instance, of the Enueg for two of the poems in Echo's Bones. Uh, and paired, this is paired with his use of uh, of um, other Provençal uh, troubadour genres, the Alba for three of the poems and the Serena for another three. And this further adds to the deep semantic capacity, the resistance to sense and sense making in its, its, in its embrace of the sensory that characterizes the collection. You know, most, most readers wouldn't know what an Enueg is, or an Alba, or a Serena. And yet, you know, in some sense, Beckett is also referring back to tradition in sort of Eliot's sense, and he's making a kind of intertextual reference to earlier genres, uh, uh, whilst also rewriting these genres. Um, and in addition to drawing on these three Provençal genres for seven of the collection's 13 poems, he complicates the reader's task further by inventing a kind of mock Provençal genre, which he calls Sainis, as we've seen. Uh, and, uh, you know, which there are two, two Sainis in the two poems called Sainis 1 and 2 in the collection. And Sainis signifies, as I, as I mentioned earlier, thin fetid pus mixed with serum or blood secreted by a wound or ulcer. And there are other medical terms that, that proliferate in the collection, such as spasm, sputum, clot, hymen, perineum, peristalsis, clonic, and so on, bringing to mind Beckett's letter to Thomas McGreevy of 18 October 1932, in which he declares that he wants to write a poetry that performs the work of the abscess something that John Pilling already noted in 1997, and that has the integrity of the eyelids coming down before the brain knows of grit in the wind. Beckett's statement shares close affinities now again with uh, Joyce, with Stephen Dedalus's definition in Portrait of the Artist of what he calls improper art. Portrait of the Artist was published in 1914, uh, in, in, in installments in the little magazine Egoist and then in novel form in 1960. The improper aesthetic, Stephen, the protagonist of a portrait of the, of, of an artist, of the artist as a young man, he says, um, he, he defines improper, the improper aesthetic as desire and loathing, which are really unesthetic emotions because they are no more than physical. And he continues, our flesh shrinks from what it dreads 
and responds to the stimulus of what it desires by a purely reflex action of the nervous system. Our eyelid closes before we are aware that the fly is about to enter the eye. So Beckett's anesthetic, as it were, or anti-aesthetic, whatever we want to call it, responds precisely to what Stephen Dedalus here condemns. And Joyce doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, um, himself, you know, accord with or his ideas about the aesthetic do not accord with Stephen Dedalus's um, ideas of the aesthetic. So um it's not Joyce's idea either. And now what one can think about these, these, these kind of rather crude bodily references, medical terms, uh, the sense in which kind of bodily suffering is foregrounded in these poems is that Beckett is really refusing the reader, the consolations of the aesthetic. Um, and the kind of metaphysical consolations or compensations of poetry in which literature is tasked with what Leo Bassani has called a, with a kind of superior patching function that operates as a kind of correction of life, as it were. That, that in a sense, the aesthetic uh, tells us a kind of affirmative, happy story, which, is, which doesn't correspond to life. A redemptive story, really. That's what um, Leo Bersani talks about in his in his book. Um, and this kind of uh, aesthetic has no place. This redemptive aesthetic has no place in Echo's Bones. Instead, Beckett is con consciously distancing himself from the affirmative tradition, advancing a poetry that is, as he puts it elsewhere, flesh locked, uh, candid and stark of vision, uh, recording the embodied visceral vicissitudes of disease, decay, and unbearable loss, and paving the way to a vast body of literature that will sustain, but also nuance the tone, tenor, and subject matter of this early poetry. But this sets the scene for Beckett's later writing, I think. Amazing, thank you very much. And we have some connection with other, I don't know, critics back at this with Descartes and other authorities, no? A kind of demolition of <laughs> these figures. Yes, absolutely, um, absolutely. And a kind of Aristotelian aesthetic uh, where we always return to a kind of new equilibrium at the end, you know, a kind of, uh, someone like Simon Critchley says, you know, tragedy, Classical tragedy, for instance, is too is is you know is not tragic enough for the modern day. It's too affirmative because at the end things always return to a kind of some sort of equilibrium. And in life, of course, that isn't true. And Beckett is when he's writing this collection in a very difficult situation, you know, where he has lost two people who are close to him, both his cousin Peggy Sinclair and his father. He's he's suffering all kinds of psychosomatic conditions. He's, um, you know, lost psychologically and really suffering. And he's not going to write a kind of affirmative, consolatory, aesthetically, you know, uh, redemptive poetry. And 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 he he turns to sort of embodied experience and ideas of suffering and 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 focuses on that in this first collection. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, speaking about figurative, <laughs> uh, Nadia will speak, will tell us about anamorphic potential of language, uh, substituting a representation for enigmatic uh, presence. Uh, and a quotation from Ilsin, Ilsin, Il said, uh, not possible any longer except as figment, not endurable. <laughs> Nadia, please. Yeah, but in fact, uh, I am glad that you're mentioning that part because it's in uh, direct relation to what uh, Ulrika just said in terms of how the body is represented in the poetry and this uh, 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 beautiful words that you explained earlier, uh, sanies and uh, this word that I've never been able to pr pronounce, putrum, uh, yeah. 
But I was I was uh, uh, thinking about the idea uh, of an aesthetic, which is also uh, which also means without feeling, uh, which I am of course very interested in. And I was wondering if there was uh, not a direct bridge from aesthetic to obscenity, but in Beckett's work, it seems that the obscene uh, is one strategy or one of the strategies to, to reach this, uh, in my uh, terminology, unlearning or dehabituation uh, and in yours, uh, obscenity. And I don't know, do, do, do you think we could not equate, but uh, put them together uh, as a as a strategy, as an aesthetic strategy. Yeah, I think so. I think that's absolutely right. That that um, well, one you know, an aesthetic of not feeling. Uh, there is a sense in which Beckett is very depressed when he's writing these poems, and of course, deep. Deep depression is uh, is not feeling really bad. It's feeling nothing. Yeah. So there is a kind of an aesthetic, you know, mm -hmm. an aesthetic going on here in the sense that, you know, he was in a very bad way uh, and and you know, really in the depths of a kind of anesthetic, anesthetized with this kind of with his troubles in a way, but in another sense, absolutely. And and I think the con connection between your work and mine here is the senses. Mm -hmm. You know that that by offending what is what is kind of appropriate, culturally acceptable, pleasing to the senses, you know, there's a kind of um, um, a kind of provocation to the senses, a provocation, and the senses, of course, mediate our sen our, our relationship to the world. We have no relationship, yes. other relationship to the world except sensory perception. It is the way in which we relate to others, to our surroundings, um, through the body. And, and therefore, you know, um, I think, yes, you're absolutely right that it's a kind of dehabituation, uh, which is something that you talk about in your work, you know, dehabituation, uh, reconfiguration of the sensorium, you know, and how the senses might work here. And, and you know, a disturbance, you know, bringing us images and and figures that we don't quite understand that shock us that we can't add up um and uh, you know it's very powerful i think yeah i think so too Danny. thank you very much <laughs> uh, danny uh, would you like to say something about this first poetry that we we you say it was a kind of affirmative and exuberant Jewish and Catholic masculinity. And... Um, no, that, that was that was what I said about um, about Joyce's uh, Ulysses and especially Night Town. So what I was interested in juxtaposing and Pat, you know, it might sound a little bit sort of bit of, of a shorthand to put it like that, but uh, because I'm interested in the role that sex work has in this early poetry, but also in the translation of an essay by a French surrealist writer called René Crevel that Beckett does also for Nancy Cunard, but for her anthology on black culture um, that comes out in 1934. Um, so Beckett translates this essay by Crevel that will then be published in 1934, but he does that in 1931. And that essay is a very radical essay that connects sex work and imperialism and denounces the link between colonialism as a form of imperialism. Crevel as well is a, a, a communist. So again, the kind of you know, political um, affiliations are very clear there. Um, and, and, you know, this essay is very powerful, I think, although in, you know, incredibly sort of like aphoristic and, you know, not exactly as a kind of academic essay. Uh, Beckett translates it and is very critical of, of this essay, he calls it miserable rubbish. And, uh, and it's quite hard to kind of, you know, read Beckett's own sort of 
quite negative judgment of the essay because the essay is actually really interesting. There are problematic aspects um, to this essay, there, there's no doubt. Um, but it's also interesting that, you know, um, I was using that uh, sort of, if you like, that kind of shorthand description of Nighttown in Ulysses to show that in Ulysses, uh, search the chapter, the idea of going to the establishment on Railway Street, okay? So going to, to the establishment of, of, of Becky, you know, Becky Cooper, who was this, uh, you know, again, this kind of um, historical figure that was uh, fictionalized by Joyce uh, as Bella, that then becomes Bello in Night Town. There is a kind of way in which sex work and the kind of male modernist going to, you know, uh, railway street and engaging in imaginative forms of sexuality, because obviously at that point, Leopold Bloom imagines to be dominated by Bello, uh, is also quite joyous and affirmative. It's not outside of a tragic register towards the end, but it's also quite affirmative. And there is something in this early poetry by Beckett and in the translations that Beckett is doing for Cunard in the early 30s, so we're talking, you know, eight, nine years after the publication of Ulysses, which is no longer happy with that, yeah? So there is that kind of, you know, quite misogynistic, uh, you know, modernist attitude that sex work is somehow liberating that no longer works in Beckett. So we are going back to what both Ulrika and Nadia were talking about in terms of that kind of redemptive impulse that is constantly sabotaged in Beckett, yeah? So there is a kind of interest in sex work. Dream of Fair to Middle Women calls the Railway Street Academy, the idea that, you know, you go and engage as a young man in, you know, sort of like, you go to a, a brother basically and engage with sex workers as a form of education. Yeah, so, the, you know, the dream of Fred Women makes already fun of that, you know, doesn't glorify it, makes fun of it. And the poet and the translation as well, then sabotage that idea that somehow, uh, you know, the male modernist gaze can see sex work as something that is somehow liberating or, uh, facilitating. So on the one hand, you basically have the sex worker that does the work, and then you have the male modernist that does the writing. Okay, so that kind of opposition that Belacqua is still very busy with in Dream of Fatal Million Women becomes disabled, unlearned, if you like, to go back to Nadia's point, you know, is unlearned in this early poetry. The, the poem is not an unqualified success, you know, is much more a kind of expression, I would say, of an, an attempt that kind of goes, um, that doesn't quite know exactly where to go. Yeah, so that's, that's I think, justifies also the fact that Beckett just dismissed it, it as, dismissed it as, a, as a, you know, a tomfoolery, you know, something that is just like a little silly. But there is, there is some, there is quite a lot in that silliness that, you know, is speaking to a discomfort you know, speaking to a late modernist moment where the kind of misogynist basis of a lot of modernist writing, especially, as I said, you know, Pound and Elliot, but also in a more, you know, as I said, more joyous and affirmative way, um, joys are, are no longer working. Amazing when you work with this, the queer theory and uh, all everything we have now <laughs> thank you very much yeah it's, it's i think is is it's more like sexual politics really for the early work that that seems to be the the framework that works better and if you if you look when the books come out when i use queer theory i mean i use it in two ways one to to think about critical theory so to think about for instance uh, the role of bersani and the crucial role that beckett has in the birth of what is called the antisocial thesis in queer theory and then I use it towards to understand aspects of the late prose and especially All Strange Away, which is also a text that counterintuitively goes back to Ulysses. Thank you very much. Well, uh, chicas, <laughs> uh, perhaps you have some questions. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Ulrika, do you, do you have some questions? 
Well, I thought it was wonderful talk, Daniela, and really important work that you're doing. And I was thinking about, you know, also that the portrait of the artist as a young man where, you know, Stephen goes, Stephen is kind of tortured, physically tortured, you know, he and he tortures his senses, you know, he sits next in, in the church next to the to the sort of quite quite you know, body odorous <laughs> peasants in order to punish himself and he, you know, denies himself all kinds of sensuous pleasures until he goes and visits a prostitute and is kind of liberated and, and almost reborn, you know, and he, yeah. So, so this is definitely, you know, there even in very early Joyce and, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, and uh, but I, I wondered about, you know, we do know, for instance, Beckett's exploits in, um, in Germany what, during his travels. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I just wondered about, you know, yeah about um his own attitudes and how you know i don't know what you what you'd say about that about beckett's own exploits you know in his private life um whilst he condemns the representation you know of as you say of of prostitution as somehow a, a kind of male privilege and uh, a, a kind of you know uh, something that Men can, men can, male modernists can think of as an education, as a liberation. Um, is it, is it, is it in his own life more complicated? I, I don't know how we should. Nadia, did you want to, to come? Yeah, I was just thinking as you were explaining and uh, uh, the, 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 the image, a transformation of what a prostitute. Uh, is in uh, modernist uh, terms, and I was I couldn't think I couldn't not but think about uh, Benjamin and the idea that the prostitute is the figure by par excellence of capitalism. Uh, so I was wondering if you had uh, uh, addressed any kind of uh, uh, criticism uh, in which uh, Benjamin was involved because uh, if I, it has been a long time, but I remember being mm -hmm. really stunned by uh, my reading of that particular part. Yeah, so to address the two questions in turn, Ulrika, you're absolutely right. I think the situation from a biographical point of view is very complicated. And in, in fact, it's very interesting that uh, John Pilling, for instance, puts in the same entry of the chronology and you know, uh, evidence of a visit to Railway Street in Dublin in 1931, uh, the day after the translation of Crevel's essay condemning the link between capitalism, imperialism and sex work happens, right? So it's definitely, you know, uh, I think one of the one of the things that I'm very, um, uh, I go to great lengths to explain in the book is that I'm absolutely not trying to recuperate Beckett as some kind of improbable, uh, you know, gender equality warrior or feminist, you know, because that is really, you know, an approach that I think would never, ever work. Um, so I think you're right. It's messy and complicated. And certainly there is a sort of um, participating in that kind of modernist moment, especially up to the 30s, isn't there? And, and you're talking about portrait. And if you think about portrait, the ending of portrait, where there is the encounter with Beatrice that absolutely restages the Vita Nuova, right? But what it is, is that, you know, he has to think of Dante as the refrigerating apparatus, literally in order to cope with the encounter with this you know, young woman who obviously is discombobulating him. You can really see that kind of opposition between the being born again after you know the visit uh, earlier on in the in the in the in the novel, and then you know this kind of refrigerating apparatus that is Dante and re revisiting the Vita Nuova, and again that then gets translated into dream in that opposition, Beatrice and and the brothel. But in the poem, it doesn't quite work. So for me, the poem is interesting because is is what doesn't quite work with that opposition. You know, it doesn't quite function anymore in the way that it should. And and I think Nadia, you're right. Um, um, Benjamin does say that there is there are you know interesting uh, volumes. I'm thinking uh, of uh, that recent, fairly recent uh, book called Revolting Prostitutes 
which is very good, isn't it? About, uh, you know, really starting to think about sex work as work within the context and materialist history of capitalism, which is, is was very useful to, to my thinking. But what we have in Beckett, it seems to me, and I think you were kind of hinting at that when you were talking about politics earlier on, that you never have, uh, even when he's collaborating with Cunard, right? Uh, you know, for her black anthology, uh, which is an anthology that starts by saying the only solution to the problem of racial equality is communism. So it couldn't be more aligned. He never uh, embraces uh, a kind of uh, specific political ideology. You know, so we have obviously, you know, evidence of anti-fascism, you know, and, you know, personal involvement in anti-fascist activities. But there is always a kind of reluctance towards the perhaps more earnest aspect of politics, mm -hmm. it seems to me. And, and that's why, for instance, in, in the book, I talk about when at a later moment, when Nancy Cunard asks all writers to take uh, their position in relation to Franco, yeah, and the Spanish Civil War. And Beckett's response is, in capital, up the Republic, with Spanish punctuation, right? So with that homage to Spanish punctuation, and of course, is both, you know, a kind of expression of support. You know, Cunard classifies his response as definitely anti-Franco and pro-Republican, but it's also non-earnest to the point of sounding almost like a joke. So he doesn't sit on the fence, but you know also doesn't, you know, doesn't write, for instance, if you compare it to, I don't know, someone who was very committed, yeah. like Sylvia Townsend Warner, right? It's not, it's not like that at all. So I think there is an awareness, you know, at this point in time, but not that kind of Benjaminian structural analysis that you would, you know, yeah. you will find in Beckett. Yeah, actually, thank you, because I absolutely agree with you when you define yeah, the, the relationship between politics and Beckett. It's, it's, uh, it's always ambiguous, and it always uh, reminds me of uh, uh, what Anna Arendt said uh, once, uh, I don't know, in which text, when she, she declares that she couldn't be affiliated with anything that ends with ism. And I think that uh, that corresponds to Beckett's relationship with politics. There is a political element, which is unescapable because of the time he lived in and uh, of who he was. But uh, I agree with you that it is, it is impossible to have this direct and uh, wholehearted without any ambiguity affiliation to one particular trend or another. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not even saying, for instance, that it's a it's a position I would share. You know, I think that there were, you know, in, but I'm equally not condemning. But I think I think by you know, if we compare it to someone like Cunard, who was really, really an activist, you know, and and you know, um, put all her money, um, you know. Uh, into into supporting uh, communism and and you know paid a very high price personally as well for doing that um, yeah that we're not we're not talking about the same the same thing yeah but I guess one could add here that Beckett avoided all sorts of categorical statements didn't he so so the political is only one of those areas where he would simply not declare anything as you know one way or another and. Of course, one of the main points where he wouldn't do anything like that was explain his own work. Uh, and, and you know, the, the works are very open to interpretation, as we know. And, and so, so there was something in Beckett's whole habitus, as it were, that, that was against any kind of categorical, uh, you know, sort of black and white commitment to a single issue. Uh, and I think one, one has to think of his political... Um, um, sort of uh, reserve, if you like, in that kind of a, a context. Um, it doesn't mean he wasn't political, but he, he, he at all. But it does mean that you know. I mean, it it does um, uh, sort of correspond to a wider um, refusal to start declaring his 
you know, declaring, categorically declaring his, his opinions, his affiliations, and so forth. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, now I will ask you some books, something you recommend for reading. I don't know, Nadia, would you like to begin? Well, I don't have it here because it's in my office, but I read recently Beckett and Buddhism uh, by uh, Angela Mulgiani, which I enjoyed tremendously. And I think that uh, it gave a lot of uh, new directions uh, to very familiar questions. And uh, I'm happy to <laughs> recommend this book. <laughs> uh, and uh, the... Malaise dans l'esthétique by Jacques Rancière, which I believe uh, has been translated into English, is uh, also a gem to, uh, to approach these questions. Uh, so these are my two recommendations of, uh, at the top of my head. Thank you very much. Daniela, please. Uh, what, what would I recommend? Well, probably Becker's poems, you know, a lot of them wouldn't, you know, necessarily be qualified as, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, I don't know, the best poetry produced in the late modernist period, but it, they're very, very interesting. So, you know, the, and this is the paperback edited by Sean Lawler and John Pilling, so that by Faber and Faber, so definitely that. Uh, I've mentioned uh, Revolting Prostitutes by Juno Mack and Molly Smith, a really interesting uh, cultural materialist analysis of sex work. Uh, and um, perhaps another, you know, a book that really was helpful to me, uh, or perhaps, I, 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 perhaps an article that was very helpful to me was Sadia Hartman and Frank Wilderson's The Position of the Unthought, uh, which was an interview that came out in Kipal in volume 13 a few years back and is a really interesting um, dialogue between two towering figures of what we might now call, you know, um, uh, what would you know, black feminist, black thought and black feminist thought, but also what is often referred to as Afro pessimism and is really theoretically challenging. So, anything by Sadia Hartman, I would hi highly recommend. But that in dialogue with Wilderson is especially fruitful, I think. Thank you very much. Udika, put forward. Yeah, I wanted to recommend this new book by Marco Bernini, Beckett and the Cognitive Method. Uh, which deals with all sorts of um, strange um, kind of limit experiences that Beckett's work is full of and that haven't really been systematically studied before. So awakenings or, or you know, various other such things. Um, uh, and it's, it was published last year by Oxford University Press. And um, it's it's got a lot of new insight into Beckett's work and especially in terms of kind of physical physiological experiences so and and cognitive experiences so so that's something I would like to uh recommend I um is Nadia going to speak again is or has Nadia already was there another talk are we going to return to Nadia no I I think we have uh I have shared as much as I could today oh okay okay well I think I, I did have a question for you. If it's, is it still okay? Please, go I would be happy to. Yeah, no, because I really love this idea of Beckett Spectro Poetics, and I thought, you know, it's very persuasive, and and you know, the idea of disjointed time and a haunting contemporaneity, con contemporaneity you talk about, and and this odd kind of sense of a past present, and uh, and a kind of time that is out of joint, and. This as a kind of, um, I guess, a, a, a dehabituation of the senses and 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 generating kind of new perceptions for us. But now, what I wanted to ask you about, and I'm sort of slightly playing devil's advocate here, but I wondered whether uh, does this become a kind of new aesthetic habit in Beckett's work? Uh, because the spectrality is there, you know, it keeps it keeps mm -hmm. returning. 
thing. And and it's a kind of dehabituation, as you say, but does it become a kind of Beckettian signature or a or a kind of Beckettian habitus or aesthetic habit uh, in the sense of kind of repetition with difference? Um, does it yeah, that was well, my well you could you could uh, uh, you could see it uh, in this deconstructive vein, uh, mm -hmm. always reiterating what you are trying to dispel. But I think that the concept of figure that I've been using as a, an operational concept uh, in my work on bilingualism prevents that gesture to happen because by definition a figure cannot be something that you can identify by resemblance it has something to do with what it departs from and this is this movement of departure that i'm interested in not from where it comes and where it goes but the coming and going and this impossibility to anchor any any kind of aesthetic gesture. And this is why I think we are still very interested in producing theater in Beckett, in uh, rereading or reinterpreting, because uh, it doesn't, you never reach an image which you can be with which you can be satisfied with it always takes you somewhere else. So the idea of, uh, uh, I don't remember the um, exact quotation, uh, but from a poem, uh, it's, it's the idea of the word in figure in movement, and that's that, the movement that I'm interested in. And to put it very simply, it's the coming and going all the time, and that's what I'm interested in. Thank you. It was just to, to be provocative. <laughs> no, but I, I, I like to be able to answer and think about these provocative questions. Thank you, Enrica. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this amazing talk. Very nice talk. Uh, just to remember that the poems now are in Portuguese, uh, translated by Gabriela, our, uh, our friend. And... Uh, Nadia, thank you very much. Daniela, thank you. Urika, thank you very much. Very nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alfonso. Yeah, that, thank you very much, Alfonso, for organizing this. Bye. Nice. Bye. Uh, remember, please, you have comments uh, under the video, and we have playlists with Beckett in Portuguese and with uh, Patrick Bixby, too. Thank you very much. Good night Thank to you everybody. So much.